share all of the amazing things that we do at the ALF Museum behind the scenes. And that includes our amazing Peccary Scholar Program and Museum Program. For those of you who may not know, the ALF Museum is the only accredited paleontology museum on a high school campus, which is the web schools. And that means we have a lot of really cool programs for the web school students to learn about paleontology, do paleontology firsthand, and prepare them for just so many different careers, even if they don't go into paleontology. And today I'm really, really excited because we have three of our amazing alums from the web schools and the web and the museum. And we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, their experiences in the museum, kind of how that prepared them and share some fun stories, um, maybe make fun of our director and our um, all of our other paleontologists at the museum and talk about some of the cool things that they've done since then. So. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Moments of Time. Thank you all so much for being here. Thanks for the invitation. Happy to be here. Right, right. Do you want me to get started with introductions? Yeah, why don't we go ahead and get started with intros, Jen? All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Liu, and I graduated from the Web Schools in the class of 2005, and I currently work at the school as the Director of Parent Relations as well. Um, so when Gabe asked me to think of a two-sentence intro, it was actually really hard. Um, so I'm going to try my best to kind of, you know, describe myself a little bit. So after college, I was a preschool teacher at an international school, and then I did a brief career in marketing for the family business, which I could talk endlessly about. It's probably the worst decision I made, but I did learn a lot. Um, and now I work in parent relations and fundraising, and I think the best part about my job is actually to share about my personal um, web experience and kind of the impact the museum program um, had on me. So I'm excited to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Awesome. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Mimi, how about you? Okay, so my name is Nicole. In high school, everybody called me Mimi, so people at Web are grandfathered in. I'm also class of 2005, and I did museum stuff all four years. Uh, still love to join whenever I can. I'm a member of the Alumni Council currently, and I'm an educator, an activist, I'm a coach. I do a lot of different things, and the museum has definitely been super influential in all of those areas in my life, actually. Um, I'm currently studying at San Jose State University, getting my master's in information science. Um, so yeah, that's that's a little bit about me. I live in Pasadena, so not far. <laughs> well, glad to have you today. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Mark Torres, why don't you introduce yourselves? Howdy, so I'm uh, Mark Torres. I'm a professor at Rice University in Houston, Texas, and I study uh, environmental chemistry. And I sort of do work on uh, rivers and soils and the ocean and uh, went to the web schools and, and was in the museum program all four years. And that kind of really set the stage for my whole career. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. So, you know, before we get started talking about like some of the cool, fun things that you all did at the museum, let me give a little background about how the museum is, um, how it works with the web school. So, like I said, we are the only accredited um, paleontology museum on a high school campus. And with that, we have an amazing program. Um, and that all starts with freshmen who can take, um, who take evolution or biology. And part of that is paleontology. And through that, they get their very, very first um, field excursion called the Peccary trip where they go out to Barstow to collect fossils for the first time. For a lot of these students, it's their first time camping. Um, so it's a lot of really cool memories out of that first um, experience in paleontology. After that, students have the choice to take um, honors paleontology and advanced studies in paleontology. Um, the advanced studies class is really cool and amazing and unique. Uh, it was created by Dr. Don Lofgren, our director emeritus, and really brought to the next level with Dr. Farkey, our current director. And what it is, is students get the chance to work in the museum, get to work with real fossils and conduct their own research. Um, hopefully some of these students produce a paper or they get to present at, you know, professional conferences. It's a really, really cool program. And it's something that, you know, the museum is very proud of seeing high school students do paleontology, produce the research that can influence the rest of the field. And if you don't want to do any of the classes, if you just want to have fun at the museum, but still help out, there's the afternoon activity program where students get to come in at the end of the day, they get to either help in the collections, they get to help prep fossils or what other, whatever kind of thing we can, um, we need help with in the museum. And um, 
there's a lot of really fun ways that we found um, students can connect with the museum that way. So with all of that, how about we kind of all share how you, you know, how you interacted with the museum during your time at Webb. Um, Mark, how about we start with you? Yeah, so um, I, I went to Webb like with the specific goal of spending time in the museum. It was sort of what excited me about at Webb and specifically, um, and so took every opportunity. So all of the, you know, different uh, summer trips, um, working in a museum after school and uh, in the summers, and then even after high school, because I was local, continued to work there, um, you know, uh, helping out with curation. And so kind of took advantage of everything and sort of taught me a lot of the skills that I still use today. And and many of the experience I had, like you sort of imagined, like, you know, uh, camping and, and sort of outdoor experiences were very uh, uh, important to me and, and, and sort of have motivated me to kind of try to, to give those experiences to other people as an educator. Awesome. Uh, Mimi, how about you? So I always felt like the Paleontology Museum was a super cool bonus to going to Web, and then I actually got involved with it and some of my longest lasting friends from high school are people that I really spent a lot of time with in the museum, either in the after school program or on the summer research trips. I did end up taking the paleontology class um, with Doc and it was just so, so much fun and it felt really cool. And it, it, you were, we were doing real science. It didn't feel like we were doing little lab projects. You know, we were like actually being young scientists. Um, and I think that that was just such a unique and special experience that I've always kind of held dear to my heart. Um, I'll also say this, that those long summer trips camping, um, I had had experience camping and backpacking before, but really like being out for three, four weeks, you know, at a time had really kind of prepared me for life living in Haiti. I lived in Haiti. I forgot to mention that in my bio, but I lived in Haiti after the earthquake for over four years. And I did um, work in higher education down there. And um, I don't want to say that like life in Haiti is terrible because it isn't. It's really beautiful and wonderful. Um, but you do have to take bucket showers. You get you get one every day. It's not like you're going weeks without a shower like we do. Like we got one shower a week on those summer trips, right? Like we were nasty, but everybody was, so it didn't matter. Um, but you know, just like things like that, or like knowing how to cook on on not not in a kitchen that we are used to here in the West, like having a sort of a makeshift kitchen, things like that really came in handy the way that I was living for uh, my, the first two years in Haiti, and and um, yeah, I, I joke about that, but it's not a joke, so. Um, yeah, it was great. The museum is amazing and, uh, definitely the best memories. Awesome. And Jen, how about you? How did you connect to the museum when you were at Webb? So I think I stumbled upon the museum because as a student, you're required to do three afternoon activities. Um, and I was not a very athletic person and I needed, I think, a quiet activity actually to kind of hide and, and retreat away from the environment of like an independent school. Um, it was, I think, kind of a, a cultural change for me um, in terms of coming back to the U.S. again because my family um, is, is from Taiwan. So I moved back and forth quite a bit when I was growing up. Um, and so I needed, I think, a quiet space to just kind of decompress from, you know, the, the the schedule of web, right? And in some ways, I think the museum provided that. Um, I just have such like great memories of freshman year of being in the prep lab, just picking through microfossils, right? Or putting on those headphones and just picking away at dirt and just having that moment to decompress but at the same time, also learn a lot, right? Like I feel like my brain was stretched in many ways, just learning about kind of like the the age of like the materials that we're dealing with and where this came from and kind of how just me as like a 15 year old um, was able to contribute to science and research in my way. Um, so that was kind of, I think my first exposure to the museum. 
And again, you know, I think we've all said about kind of the important life skills you pick up as camping. That is also certainly very true. Um, and like Mark, I came back and worked at the museum during the summers, during high school and in college and kind of as a young adult too. Um, and Doc just had projects for me to work on it. And thinking back on it, it kind of was my training ground to build up these like what I think are really strong project management skills um, that I think certainly are things, you know, skills that I re like, rely on, you know, when I was a teacher, as a fundraiser right now, doing kind of relationship work and all that kind of stuff. So in, in many ways, the museum set a lot of building blocks, I think. Um, and it's just really good. And it's good that Doc is still there, right? He's a great mentor. Um, and it's great that Andy's there and we have this super awesome staff. Um, and to kind of come see things kind of like full circle in some ways, I get a little like emotional and philosophical about it too. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I, I think it's really cool because like for me, I didn't go to web, you know, I came here, I came to web in 2015 and getting to meet you know, like you, Jen, on my first year and like all of you and all the other alumni, it's such a cool um, like family feeling that you all have where, you know, you go through this program together. And even if you weren't in the same class, you all kind of have this connection with each other, like, you know, your older siblings kind of weird way. And there's just always these fun memories that I love to hear of people when they come back to the museum, because a lot of alumni love to come back because it was such an important part of their their quote formative years, you know, and I, I, that's such a cool thing to see for me. And you know, for all of you, um, what do you think was like the one thing that the, you you took away from the museum when you, after you graduated and have kind of really carried with you since then? That's a hard thing to sort of pick one thing. Uh, but like, you know, on the theme of like, you know, I'm now a professional researcher. Uh, I always remember one thing that uh, Dr. Lofgren sort of said, uh, he was reflecting on his own time in graduate school and he was sort of quoting another um, student in his cohort. And that student would say, well, no one's teaching us how to do research. And, and I think the kind of the reason he said that is like, no one teaches you you learn by doing like there's, you know, you can't take a class like this is how you do it. You have to do it. And that's very much how he led his uh, sort of upper level museums classes. Like we didn't learn about research, we did research. And a lot of the excitement and sort of non-linear discovery where you sort of you'll spend a lot of time and get nowhere. And all of a sudden there'll be one breakthrough and then you just go really far, really quickly. And you get very excited because it's like, we've learned something completely new. Uh, and, and that kind of experience sort of just sort of stayed with me, motivated everything that I've done subsequently and, you know, continues to be my day-to-day -day experience. Awesome. Jen, Mimi? It's really hard to pick one thing because this is like one of those really special programs that reaches into your life in, in so many ways. So like, I'd have to like choose a hat, like which <laughs> way does it influence me in this hat, like as an educator or as a human or, you know, um, and, and not to get really cheesy with it, but something that I think about a lot um, is the idea. And, and now as an educator, as a high school educator, I understand why people have like mottos or they have certain quotes by people that you repeat all the time, but you know, what will you do with your moment in time is something that um, is is almost like a guiding principle for me in my life. I'm, I, as cheesy as it sounds, it's true. Um, you know, as a, I'm a public school educator, I worked in Haiti, I'm pursuing this degree in library science. Um, I'm a believer in information. I'm a believer in science and you know, what are we, what are we going to do with all of that? What are we going to do as individuals, as a society, as a community, as a family? Um, and so that's something that I think about all the time. And I know that's sort of really broad and, and vague, but that is something that is, is, is super influential. Um, I guess that's one. I used my one. I used my one on what will you do with your moment in time? That was my moment. <laughs> I think we'll take it. Uh, you know, for those of you who may not know, 
what will you do with your moment of time was is not just is it's it's what Ray Alf would say um, when he was a teacher at Webb and you know he created the museum with that motto in mind and you know when you walk in it says it says it in the museum and it really does affect a lot of the the framework that we do things at the museum. Uh, Jen will definitely tell you that because we joke about it sometimes. You know, we'll, we would come in the morning. Hey, Jen, what will you do with your moment of time today? But it, it is, it is actually something that we we take to heart, <laughs> right, Jen? Oh, absolutely. I guess to expand on that a little bit, um, I, I think it really is this. You know, like through like the outdoor experiences and the camping trips, it's this like relationship I've built with nature, right? And how that has grown and impacted my life, right? And it's just when work gets stressful, right? Like we're trying to come out of a pandemic. Like I think back to Barstow, I think back to the summers in Utah, right? I think about that connection with nature. And I think having that ability to connect and take a breath and like just go for a walk and, and notice things, right? and notice that there's so much out there, I think it really does, like I said, help me kind of decompress and kind of resets my mind, right? And, and again, like it's very philosophical, it's hard to explain, right? But really that appreciation to nature and that connection that you have with like the ground that you're walking on, right? And kind of learning like your moment of time in history and geological history and all of that kind of stuff, um, I think is really powerful. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I didn't go to web, but being at the museum still, it's like you walk around sometimes after you you're been in the collections and you just see things differently. Mm -hmm. Like the tree, the like a rock over there, not to be kind of corny, but it's like the the perspective of deep time when you when you're in a museum and you get to see these extinct creatures and you're probably the first person to see it. It does kind of change the way you see the world around you as it changes, I would say. Um and kind of like on that, you know, Jen, like you talked about, and you, you've all kind of touched on. Um, some folks may think that you know our purpose at the at the the museum and the web schools is to create new paleontologists. You know, they think people are going to go through this program and all become paleontologists. Obviously, that's not true. All of you here are like great examples of that. Um, but I think an important thing of it is, I think um, Mimi, Mark, you both had touched on it is it's the exposure to science, doing science. And that's very, very important. Um, for all of you, what do you think programs like the museum and other programs in high school, um, why is it so important for these for students to have these experiences with science as they go on to other careers that may not seem connected to them? Um, I'll jump in, uh, sorry, real quick. Uh, so I think one thing of like, in most education, in high school, college, uh, you're given problems where there's a very clear answer. However, you leave college and most of the problems you face in a job or in life don't have clear answers. They're very ill-posed. You're not even obvious like how do you even get an answer to the problem. And part of the problem is figuring out like how to go about even answering it. And that's very much what research is. There's not a clear answer, there's not even a clear pathway, and it's all about discovery. And that skill set is useful, uh, you know, kind of writ large, writ large, you know, if, no matter what you end up doing, you're going to be facing those kinds of problems in your life. And the earlier you experience them and learn how to tackle them, and that sort of framework of problem solving is still the better. I, yeah, I would, I agree with all of that. And I also think that um, paleontology being an earth science just like sets the foundation to connect to so many other areas of science, like real issues, climate change, it's a real issue. We can learn from the past. We can learn from the fossils. We can learn from the earth, like as in the ground, um, the rocks, the sediment, right? We can there's just so much. So the museum and sort of to what to Jen's point about being really connected to nature and understanding our place in the grand scheme of things, like at this juncture where we are now in the present moment, I think it's super important to have a solid understanding of, of earth science and the paleontology program at Webb absolutely 
prepares students to, to understand those very basic sort of principles um, and elements. I mean, I wholeheartedly agree with what both Mark and, and Mimi have said. I think, you know, something I've been reflecting back on is like science communication, right? So I think part of the, what I think is such a, like a strength of West Paleontology Research Program is you kind of develop those research skills of like collecting data, reading research papers. But I think the important step is then sharing that information out to a community, right? And I think, again, you know, we've all had to look at a lot of data. We've all had in some ways become our own data scientists as we navigate the rules and all these changing landscapes of the pandemic. And I just think that the ability that I can look at a data set and make those informed decisions for myself about what is going on, like that foundation came from kind of, I think the experience I have in the museum program, right? Like it's like, I'm drawing like broad parallels between data and stuff like that. But I think that is is really important. And I think about like all the work Gabe, you're doing with our current students about science communication and thinking about, it's not just about us building up our own knowledge of science and playing those skills, but sharing it to a broader community so that people are understanding the work and why we're doing this, right? So I think that is why it's, it's cool because it isn't just, I think, like Mark said, linear, it applies to different aspects of our lives. And if, if I could add, like, in ter just in terms of how the, the museum and the work in the museum influenced me, I mean, I'm doing a degree in information science right now, and I'm taking a data class. And it's like, I already know how to do it. And I learned how to do it in high school, to Jen's point, like, because I learned how to catalog things. Like, I was doing information science when I didn't know it was information science. Microsoft Access. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I will let you know, we've upgraded the database since then. We now use specify. So, but all of your hard work has been transferred over with the few, few, few improvements. Not that you all messed up, but you know, we've, we've upgraded things a bit since then. <laughs> Oh my God, so, I love that you brought up Microsoft Access because the three of us were chit chatting before we went live about what stories we can share about the skill sets we've built. And all of us remember Doc telling us to go into the collections room, pulling out each drawer physically, and going to a legal pad and writing down the locality number and trying to track those specimens, right? So, talk about developing a system, collecting data, entering into Microsoft Access, and now it is part of Specify. Like, what a journey. Like, let's let's kind of take a trip back in time with that, Jen. Like, what was it like the first time you kind of, you know, entered the museum for you? Like, either in your class or the museum program, your first peccary trip. What was like that? Did you have like an aha moment where you're just like, I'm in a, I'm in the museum. This is cool. I would say yes and no, right? Because I lived on campus. So this museum, the museum physically was like a building that we could enter, right? So it wasn't like I felt like I was entering something special. It just seemed like there's so much unknown about it. And it prompted my curiosity to discover the rooms that people couldn't see, right? Because we could have all walked through the museum. We all kind of got introduced it on the Peccary trip. So we all have some basic understanding about the history of the museum, the role it plays in Webb's history and part of the freshman course, right? But I think it's really when you dig deeper into like the prep lab and the collections room and kind of the behind the scenes stuff that I think you really start to understand the, like the scope and, and uni uniqueness of the program. Um, yeah. I, I have to mention this because the three of us were there when the museum got remodeled. And so um, that was like major, like Doc always talks about this is a world-class museum. It's going to be a world-class museum. We're on the road to world-class museum, world-class museum, right? <laughs> and he did that. And we were there for that transition. So, and it was really cool because we got to be in the videos. Remember y'all? Yeah. We were in the video. Someone's got to find it. It's hilarious. There's a song. It's amazing. Anyway, <laughs> I should have brought that for today. That was definitely a moment where it was like, 
wow, we are really, we're doing this. We're doing the research and we're applying that research and we're deciding, we're, we, for the advanced paleontology class, we had to do an, a, a display from the text to the images to the like actually building it and putting it in, right? So it, it was really like a holistic experience in terms of not just doing the research, but also doing the curatorial stuff. Um, and that was really special. And that, that when, when the Hall of Footprints, right? The bottom, that's the Hall of Footprints. When it reopened, that was an, that was like a wow, totally, completely different and just like so, such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful exhibit that really kept a lot of the old, like a lot of the stuff that honored how it all began and made it a museum where people would really want to, a world, a world class museum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about you, Mark? I, uh, you know, in working there in the summer, sort of had the pleasure of being able to spend a lot of time, a lot of unsupervised time in that museum. And I, uh, I went through every single drawer dozens of times, just looking at everything. Cause there's just, and I, and like, there were like drawers I would come back to of like, I, you know, I remember there was like this particular, you know, fossil that was really cool. But just like that, just being, that having access to that, just being able to like, look, here's collections, it's a collections that, you know, people fly, at least around the United States, I assume around the world, but I'm not percent sure, to visit these collections to do actual research. And I, here I can, on my leisure, look through everything and see it all. And, you know, that has just been, you know, an amazing thing that most people don't get to do. I, I, you know, even working at the museum, there are times where I just, I get this moment where I'm like, I just like looking at the things, you yeah, know, because no. it's, it's just fun, you know, and then even working there, there are times when you open a drawer and you see something that you've not quite seen before. And it's just like, what is this? This is so cool. And you can discover something new every day. And it, it's a really cool experience. Um, so I can only imagine what it was like as a high school student. Cause I know if I went to web as a high school student, I would have been like one of those nerds who would have found every single moment to just bother Dr. Farkey or Dr. Lofgren at the time. <laughs> Um, speaking of Dr. Farkey, he gave us a question for you all. So Dr. Farkey wants to know, what is your favorite fossil from your time as a student, one that you discovered or one you got to work at, work with in the collection? Oh, man. It's a hard question. So A, I don't remember the specimen's name, but I think this like the specimen like or the fossil I remember the most, like going back to what Mimi said when we had to film that video that one year we were out in the Kapirowitz and like hiking out with that, like that image is like seared into my head of that video we created, right? And plastering the thing around it on that little like ledge, right? And knowing that like the museum team went back out there for probably a decade and that little ledge that i was trying to stand on to like cheer up and down as we like film the helicopter lift right like that ledge you guys like dug in there's like real work that was done right um so i think that must have been my my favorite one just because like going back to a moment of time it's like overused right like that was my moment of time with that specimen and then you guys carried on that moment of time and made it an experience for other students that were like a decade younger than me right um so that would be my favorite fossil i remember a grueling one also <laughs> kapirowitz where we had to carry out on the metal bars the femur <laughs> and we had to um it was very heavy yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was, and it was hot and we were kids and we had a whole system. We had, you know, like transferring. So we didn't actually stop, right? Like we never, we stopped like twice on that three and a half mile hike or whatever it is in an, in, I think one way it's three, about three miles. Um, so yeah, that was, that was awesome. I also remember the airlift um, as a student. I don't remember working with anything like I can't, it's hard to remember specifically something in the lab um but definitely that femur that's that's ingrained in my brain because and still probably in my folders too 
I, I was on that trip too. I remember, I remember carrying that. Um, no, there was a, a trip that I went on with only like one other student. I think it was just me and Cooper on like a weekend trip with Don and a volunteer to the Gola Formation, which is like a very unforgiving place to look for fossils because you never find anything. Uh, but the other student there found a shark tooth, which is like the first to be found in that area. And it really kind of changed a lot of, you know, what, what was sort of people thought about that particular part of the formation. And so like being there, witnessing that discovery was, was pretty cool. Yeah, I remember that. I did find a turtle shell on an alumni peccary trip in Barstow, and it was awesome. I remember that. But that, that was a cool was turtle. A that was I think that could count. Years ago. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think coming back to like peccary trips, for those of you who may not know, um, the peccary trips are our what we call our field excursions. It's where we do field work to go looking for fossils. And it's all named after the very first discovery at Ray Alf. The story, you know, the legend now as it has become goes that like Ray Alf um, took his students out to Barstow in 1936. And one of his students who was also the son of the, of the web school's founder um, slid down a hill. And uh, apparently he ripped his jeans on something and when Ray Alf went back to look at what he ripped his jeans on, it turned out to be the canine of a peccary, which is a pig-like relative um, that used to live here in North America. Um, and so with that very first discovery, you know, uh, it sparked Ray Alf's love of paleontology and teaching paleontology. And so to honor that story, all of our trips out are now named peccary trips. Um, you know, there are these whole big things, you know, it's a really cool experience for a lot of high school students, as, as it has been for all of you. Um, and there are a lot of cool places that we go to. You've mentioned Kaparowitz, which is done at uh, Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in Utah. The Gola Formation, um, which is up um, near Central California, out in the deserts. Um, we do Barstow every single year, which is a great 15 million year locality. And so there's a lot of really cool places that we go. And there's, it's also kind of just an experience. There's like traditions we do on, on the Peccary trips. And for all of you, like, can you share like some of your favorite memories or like the silly things that might've ha happened when you're on Peccary trips with each other? I mean, campfires, you know, are an obvious one, but uh, um, you know, in the desert, there's a lot of dry shade breath and sometimes you can get a pretty big fire going. Uh, it's just, uh, <laughs> You know, sitting around a bunch of high schoolers, giant fire, uh, you know, is a real primal attraction to them. I, I'm an adult and I still like that, so. <laughs> I mean, there are so many, but I just remember on the summer trips, right, like digging the latrines, right? And it's like, how are we going to figure out the bathroom and the shower situation? And I just remember, like, I'm going to find a spot that I need to have, like, to do my business, right? And then you just claim your spot, right? And so, like, that is just kind of a funny thing. Like, we all just kind of had an understood system. Like, when we get back, how are we going to, like, you know, wipe ourselves down and have our system, right? Like, as teenagers, we figured it out. Yes, we all smelled, but we were trying to be hygienic in, in, in some way. And I just remember sharing that kind of as an adult to other people who haven't had that experience they're just like you're kidding me that like it seems like silly to believe that you would do that but i was like yeah it's part of it's part of life it's part of camping and everything um completely forgotten about that <laughs> right? how would we we also used to it it was a big deal like it was a big it's yeah. not a big deal but as a part of setting up camp no it was yeah and the and the solar showers and we would have like two and like it was like only two people could take a shower a day there was like a real extreme limit on it I and mean, then uh, there are people that kind of took a bit too many i thought too like <laughs> oh yeah Ooh, here we go let's go yeah. let's get into it <laughs> um fighting over spots in the vans or the truck yeah. you know not really fighting but like claiming like oh no i'm gonna ride oh when we got big red right that was also <laughs> our in our time like big yeah. red that was a thing and like That's who would like get to ride in big red and who had to schlep it in the vans um yeah. big red had air conditioning the vans I did not 
Yeah. I didn't realize that Big Red came when you all were there. I thought yeah, it was older that, than that. that. Was also really, yeah. This is like a pivotal moment for the museum, I think, is the early 2000s. Um, and, you know, just like the long car rides. Uh, I remember when Mr. Zahn, he's also an alum, Will Zahn, he chaperoned one of the summer trips and he brought Taboo. And so then his van was really fun to ride in because while we were driving, we just played Taboo the whole time, like the whole way. And uh, that was fun. Um, but that's not, you know, like peckery dirt or silly stories. That's just <laughs> how we pass the time on like 10 hour car rides. And I'll, I'll, I'll admit something embarrassing. Uh, I never took a solo shower. Um, I never did. <laughs> I, you I waited, always, waited for town? Yeah, I'd always, like, you because if you got lucky, you'd go into town on a resupply, and then there'd be a, a thunderstorm, and you'd get rained out, and you get to spend a night in a hotel, and you got a real shower. So I always just, like, bank on that, and, like, you know, sometimes it'd be, you know, two weeks. Um, but, you know. I, that's I hilarious. I was, I, I, that's a good bet though because it's like if you if you play it right you get not just you get just a shower a hot shower but a bed too yeah and they faked it <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding i know that never happened to me i was never on the crew that got rained out yeah i had a lot of rain out experiences i picked it right yeah <laughs> um I've got a question from the one and only Larry Ashton, who is the chair of the museum board. Uh, Larry is asking for each of you, what is your favorite peccary meal? And, you know, if one of you could actually explain the peccary pans also really quick for our audience at home, please. All right, so the peccary pan, they are cast iron skillets. And in these cast iron skillets, you or the tradition was that everything was cooked in these cast iron skillets on the open flame, um, breakfast, dinner, right? And the kids did it. Um, by the time it came to our time, you know, we used propane stoves, but we had peccary pans for breakfast, right? Like we still got to use the peccary pans for breakfast meals. And breakfast is just not my favorite meal, but using the peccary pan in general, it's not, but using the peccary pan is a, f a really fun thing. And they have numbers on them, right? And it's like, you know, they're the original, some of them are the original pans. So it's kind of a cool legacy, fun thing. Um, but I I don't know. I don't, what's a peccary meal? Help me. Well, I, I guess just, golden brown. Yeah, on the on the peccary pan thing though, my, the, the, like the thing that I remember about it, which I still do to this day, is you cook the bacon first and then everything yes. else in the bacon. Yes. And yes. I yes. that Use the, the bacon grease. breakfast is that you just cook everything in bacon grease and it's a lot better. It is. It's delicious. Oh, yeah. I remember the first time I got to make a golden brown when I was out on like a Barstow trip. Yeah. And I was like, what? I, you know, I'm a city kid. I was like, what's happening right now? Everybody's so excited. And all the I watched everybody were like, you got to do this. You got to do this. And so I made one and I was like, oh. Oh, I get it now. This yeah. is delicious. Yeah, secret. The golden brown is the pancake, by the way. Yeah. Yes, that I remember the golden brown and the pancakes, but I don't remember like, was there a meal we always had on a peccary trip that I'm just forgetting, like at dinner time or something that was like a classic that we had every single time? I, I mean, yeah. I, I think it was like really basic stuff of like, you know, we'd have a pasta night, we'd have like, you know, chicken burrito, like bean burrito kind of stuff. I remember once when we were in Montana, there was like some people in town that just happened to like notice us and invited us over to this house and they had like shot a moose and we all had moose burgers at some like people in Montana's house. And uh, they had like a, a stick shifted Jeep in their backyard and like one of the other students like was like, oh, can I drive that? And like drove it like maybe 200 feet before you know, ever all the teachers and everyone's like, whoa, you cannot be driving that. <laughs> you know, it, it, there's fun, but there are teachers, there is supervision, yeah. there is responsible adults on these trips, just to let everybody know. I think, think 
But going back to peccary meals, I guess what I remember is um, Cooper Johnson, class of 2006, who we all know very well. Cooper was in charge of like meatball night. Like he had a system for the meatballs he would do for the spaghetti nights that we did, right? Like he would probably want to go into town so he can get a shower. But his excuse was like, I'm going to restock and get the meat and make meatballs, right? So like easy to do like, you know, tomato sauce and like spaghetti. But there were times when Cooper made meatballs and they're pretty good. Um, And then I think because I always want some sort of Asian food, I'd be like, we're going to figure out stir fry on the campsite, right? Yes. Like I'm going to go into town, right? And buy some vegetables and we're going to do stir fry. We're going to have rice. We need something else besides the food that we've been eating. Right. Um, And I think stir fry is a, is like a meal thing now. And like on the peccary trips, right? Like we asked the dining hall to prepare stuff. Right. So the kids now do stir fry in their peccary pans, which I think is kind of awesome. And we, you know, Larry has his own special peccary pan too, because we gave that to him. He has one just for him, an original one with, with his name on it. That's I think awesome. we gave Larry number one, right? We did give Larry number one. They had yeah. number one for Larry. <laughs> did, what, you know, I'm from the Farky era of field work. So all of our meals had very special names like Farkaroni, um, <laughs> um, Fettuccine El Farky. Did, did you guys have special names? Did Doc give special names to his, to his food when you were out with him? No, but um, one thing that I think we did was an like, unhealthy amount of soda. Uh, like we always like we'd have a, a, like multiple coolers, but there was one cooler in the tent on the summer trips, like dedicated only to soda. And at some point, we'd like ration it. It's like we're buying too much. Like people get like two or three a day. Um, <laughs> well, Doc was, had his diet cokes. Yeah. No, I mean, it, 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 was a, it was a bad example. We were just sort of <laughs> keeping up with him. Yeah, Doc would always crack open Diet Cokes for, for breakfast. That was his breakfast. Yeah. It was. Now he's transitioned to Coke Zero. So, but yeah, he has it for oh. breakfast. But yeah, I don't remember names. I do remember we were like a foodie bunch. So like Jen cooked meals, I cooked meals, Cooper cooked meals. And we're still foodies to this day, so... Maybe not a peccary thing, but they certainly allowed us to be ourselves on the trips. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark, awesome. I remember your parents coming to visit. And it was it your mom that would bring this special like snack mix. I don't remember what it is, but she would come up with giant Ziploc bags of like this like trail mix or snacks mix that she would mix for us. And I'm trying to remember what the blend was. Oh, is, I think it's Trix, Peanuts and M&M's. Oh yeah, that was. Oh my awesome. god, that was like yeah, it was like a special treat that we got. I remember when you I don't when, know, when bird seed. I don't know why how like how it works out, but and um, Larry and Alicia would roll up with the red vines. So when they would roll into camp, camp we were like, score! Somebody <laughs> brought the candy. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it sounds like there was a lot of fun memories, obviously, obviously to be made on these peccary trips, and like I think for all of you when you're you know you're high school students you're out in the middle of nowhere sometimes or what seems like in the middle of nowhere to people but you're out there with your group of the you know this group of friends in a way and you know does these peccary trips do you feel like they create like these really strong connections with your fellow peccary students when you're out there and the you know like just experience of being in the wilderness collecting fossils with people does that kind of does that leave its mark on like people when you when you go on and graduate? Um, literally yesterday, I brought up some somehow we got in this conversation. I'm like with a bunch of other, you know, scientists from around the world, and we're discussing. And somehow someone asked, like, "Do you have any nicknames?" I'm like, "Yeah, I have a lot of nicknames, <laughs> and they're all from peccary trips. Uh, <laughs> a lot of them were ones Mimi created, but." Uh, <laughs> No, I mean, it's still, it's still to my day. Like, like, I won't ever forget uh, all the different things I was called and, and that sort of t- the kind of jokes and inside jokes and stuff we had. It's almost like if you went on a peccary trip, there's this like camp lingo is what I call it, right? It's like now we're trying to present and we're talking about stuff. But I also know that like 
even if I haven't seen Mark in like 10, 15 years, like I could call him by his nickname and he knows exactly what I'm referring to and we can form like an instant connection or a bond, right? Um, and you kind of just get transported over time, right? And you're, you're bringing back us back to when, you know, we were 17, 16, um, but kind of look at us two, two decades later, kind of still reminiscing about these fun things and also connecting with the people in the audience that we know from our time there as well. Um, so those really are very special. Yeah, definitely. And I have to and say, sorry, like how much, how, like, I didn't realize it, but I loved it. Some parts back in the day, we didn't have reception. So there was no cell phone. Like it just didn't matter, right? Just the ability at that point to just not have to have your devices with you, right? Like, yeah, we read so books, we played card games. I know, right? I was like, yeah. And it just yeah. it didn't really matter if I had notifications on my phone or, you know, we took if naps. I my, if we took <laughs> naps or if I had my phone charger or not, like it just, it really didn't matter. I, I think that the friendships are definitely lasting and created a really unique bond. Um, for example, I was living in Haiti and I hadn't spoken to Jordy or Danielle Barron, Danny Barron in years and Jordy reached out to me and Jordy and I were friends at Web. We played water polo together, but we spent the majority of our time together, like in terms of our friendship, at museum stuff, um, either on the summer trips or working in the museum. And she reached out to me and was like, hey, I think you live in Haiti. Are you there? I'm coming for work. She worked for Operation Smile at that time. And I said, yeah. And we met up and it was it, you know, like Jen was saying, like, no time passes. Like, I'm super happy to see Mark here tonight. I was like, Dr. Torres, you know, like, it's just, <laughs> I just love it. And we do sort of have these, like, we, we went through things that weren't just like school. Like we, we did stuff together, like research. We had to learn to collaborate and we had to learn to not kill each other on summer trips. And we had to, we, there were like hardly ever, there was hardly drama, ever drama if I, in my years, but like, you know, you're teenagers, so. Definitely got lost yeah. once. Wait. I think Wyatt Kapirowitz definitely, like, there was a time getting back to camp that, uh, like, completely lost for, like, maybe an hour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that that's happened. Yeah. But so you go through these things together, and it does sort of create this bond that is always there, you know, despite time and distance. Yeah, it's really cool. It, it it seems like it kind of you all were able to grow up a little bit together in like these really cool outings and peccary trips, and I don't think that's that's an experience that I think obviously not a lot of people have that privilege or opportunity. But with the web school program, you know, all of you obviously show that it it really helped helped you mature in a way. Is that is that fair to say? I mean, I don't know if I would put it that way, but I mean, certainly like left an impression. I don't know if I'd call myself mature now, but. Uh... <laughs> well, we had responsibilities. It did sort of teach us in that sense, like even to Jen's point of building the latrine, like setting up camp, breaking down, doing dinner, doing dishes, like all of those things, like they, it did teach us sort of how to be and how to be in community and how to share responsibility. And I, and I guess that's a factor in maturity. Cool. Um, so we're coming close to the end of our panel. Um, so I want to bring it back to school. And um, I want to talk a little bit about the the man, the myth, the legend, Dr. Don Lofgren, um, who, who was all of your teachers at the time. And Dr. Lofgren is retiring at the end of this year. So um, let's talk a little bit like what was it like having someone like Dr. Don Lofgren and maybe kind of like in general, was it like having like someone like a scientist to teach you and mentor you um, through your time at web? So I, I was, I was anticipating this question and I'm going to try really hard not to cry because um, he's just really special, but to have someone in high school. And I think one of Doc's superpowers was, really accepting this, the kids for who they are. Like he never wanted to change any of us. Like he loved the ways that we were different from each other. And he loved that he could connect with us and get us excited about science and about paleontology. 
And, you know, he, he is a pretty quiet guy, but he would like tell us that we were special to him, even in those years, right? Like by putting our picture on the wall and showing us like, hey, you made the wall, you know, by his desk. And I think that's really important, especially at a, at a boarding school where so many of the students are away from their families. Like he really was that person that you could go to and he wasn't gonna judge you. He was always gonna want the best for you, even when you make mistakes. Like he might be frustrated or something, but it was very parental in that sense, almost unconditional love. And that is like really, really special. Yeah, I mean, along those lines of like, you know, all the, the sort of science education, you know, obviously really can't be compared to anything else. But I, I would say beyond that, he was just, you know, he's a person. And like that really came across in like the sort of relationship. He wasn't just a teacher, you know, they were like, like all like these are every bit of classic rock that I know, like is from Doc and and you know he sort of engaged with us about that kind of stuff and like playing guitar and we sort of talk about the guitar but then when it also came down to of like you know if there was some you know you know we all like we're in high school we, we do dumb things sometimes and like <laughs> be very honest and direct in like in, in a way that you know wasn't patronizing or like oh you're as an authority figure like you know but it's just like look you know you're messing up like stop it and, but you know you, you can listen to him you can connect with him because it was it wasn't just you know a teacher or something he was like a uh, you know, someone you, you connected with on a lot of different levels. Well, it's hard to, I think, add more to it. I think just it's, I think people who have had, you know, the pleasure of getting to know Doc through different like times in their life. Like I always kind of joke, right? Like kind of in life when I'm kind of like caught in a pickle, I'm like, what would Don do, right? Like WWDD is what I tell myself, right? Like if I if I have a problem, if I'm trying to navigate something, if I'm trying to make a decision, like in some ways he's this like guiding force, right? So I kind of secretly tell myself like, what would Doc do, right? So I try to channel a little bit of his energy and kind of his wisdom, his calmness, his sarcasm, his knowledge and kind of, it, again, it kind of recenters myself, right? So I often ask myself, like, what would Doc do in this situation? And for the most part, in some ways, he is still very influential in kind of my, in my problem solving skills when it relates to work, my personal life, or like I said, you know, we kind of just get caught in a pickle sometime and I just think about Doc. Uh, can I, and can, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Oh, as I was gonna say, there's uh, the calmness. I remember one time I got called up on Saturday morning because a pipe burst in the collections room and it flooded. And uh, since I was like a day student, I sort of drove over and a bunch of other people like volunteered, like just pumping water out. But uh, maybe that was the, the most frustrated I ever saw Doc. But even then, <laughs> it was like that, the level of frustration that you can imagine of like a, a flood risking the whole collections, it was like very collected. And I think he was sort of just, I think, the joke he made, which is like the sign of his frustration, was like, you know, if it gets a little bit more humid, we'll have a cloud down here and maybe get some rain. Uh, <laughs> That's Doc. That's Doc, 100%. That is Doc. I, I, when I moved back from Haiti and I finished my education degree and then I got my first job and got my first apartment here in Pasadena, I had seen him at a web event like a few weeks before. And I was like, oh, I'm moving into my first apartment. I'm going to have a housewarming. I'll invite you. And I was joking. And he was like, no, really, invite me. And I did. And he came. So, like, this is, like, a measure of who this man is. Like, he will, he, you know, like, why would he come to a housewarming party for his student who's now grown and, like, he hasn't seen in years, you know? But he, that's how much he cares about us. And, and we love him, too, right? Like, obviously, he's so, so important to us. But... Um, yeah, I think just going the extra mile and he wants to know, like, he wants to know what we're doing. And he, he's, he's one of the most, I don't know. He's just one of the most supportive people, supportive educators, um, I've, I've ever met. Like he really just believes in, in us. I think, you know, that's so true working with doc. And I think Dr. Lofgren has created this 
this atmosphere and like this culture at the museum that, you know, he, but also Dr. Farkey, they both work very, very hard to, to make sure that everyone at the web schools knows and understands that they are welcomed as themselves at the ALF Museum. And that even for, you know, our guests, you know, our visitors, we really try hard to create this, this atmosphere that everyone is welcome at the museum. And it's, it kind of goes into the part of like, um, we're all a part of this world kind of thing. And both Doc and Andy really, really try their hardest to make sure that the museum is accessible to as many people as possible, that the program is, is available to people and that everyone can participate and find themselves at the museum. So everything you've all just said, I, it, it's, it's one of my favorite parts of working there and um, definitely working with Doc, who I will miss a lot. And like you said, Mark, like Doc's calmness, even when he's mad, like I remember, I remember one time he, he, I heard Doc, like I could hear the frustration in his voice, but I still could barely hear what he was saying because there was a lot of noise in the background. And I was just like, this man has a way of, of showing anger and frustration without actually showing it, you know? And I was like, that's talent right there. <laughs> Um, so we're getting close to the end of our panel. I just want to, you know, start by saying thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you all for sharing your stories. It really goes to show you how awesome this program is because all three of you have just these amazing, successful people. And, you know, it's, it's really cool for me who, you know, who's somewhat new to the museum and in the grand scheme of things to just to see like the amazing impact it's that it's had on students like you. And it's something that I hope to instill on students now and in the future. So thank you all so much. Um, let's let's kind of end things with uh, if there's a web student, you know, there's a, a future web student applying, they're excited about the museum, they want to start, you know, doing the museum program, the, the after school program, go on peccary trips. What's the one piece of advice that you would give them to prepare them for joining the museum program? This is gonna sound super cheesy, but literally just like open your heart and open your mind and just go for it. There's no right or wrong way to experience the museum program. Um, and I think like really like Dr. Farkey has built upon, right? Like, you know, the legendary Ray Alf to like the Don Lofgren era, right? Um, and he has really built upon that to like you said, make it available who to whoever who wants to try it at your pace and at how you want to do it right there's no one prescribed method right so again just i think open your mind to it and open your heart to experience something that is very very special yeah that's a hard one i don't know I mean, I think like, I mean, you're like along with my, like the advice, just do it. Like, like, you know, yeah, like, go for it. <laughs> like this is like invest all of your time and like take advantage of every single opportunity that you have, you know, with the museum, just cause it's, it's something you can't get anywhere else. And sort of, as we sort of discussed, like it's not specific to you wanting to be a paleontologist, that it's like experiences that you're never going to forget and skills that you're going to, going to come handy. And like the, you know, should never be a hesitation about sort of going in all the way. I totally agree. That's, I would, and I would say go for it and be flexible because whatever happens, you know, you're going to have to learn to, to work with what's in front of you. So, um, and that's, I think that's, that's part of the process that we've been talking about all night too, just learning how to learn by doing. You're gonna have obstacles, you're gonna have things that come up that you didn't think about. And so what are you gonna, how are you gonna react? You gotta be flexible, you gotta be um, agile, you know, in the sense of like learning how to navigate different different scenarios. Yeah. If any peccary, future peccary student is watching this, my piece of advice to you is when we tell you to bring a large water bottle and a sleeping bag on the peccary trip, do that. Yeah. Don't don't think a water a plastic water bottle is going to do it because um, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna be out of luck with that. 
Oh, I guess on like practical advice, good shoes too. Good hiking shoes. Like if you're going to go outside mm -hmm. and experience that, like, you know, Converse are not going to cut it, right? Your Yeezys, don't bring them out, right? Get a good <laughs> pair of shoes and break them in and treat them well. I was going to say that. I was going to say, make sure you break them in. Don't bring your new hiking boots on the peccary trip. Your feet are going to hurt. But I mean, you, there, there's not, there's, there's room for comfort. And uh, I, I do this to the day. I, I still go camping regularly, but uh, I own the biggest possible tent. And I think when on Peccary trips, I shared with Alex Greening, uh, two of us shared an eight person tent. <laughs> because, you know, like, why not? You're going to be living in it for a month. You, you might as well have some space. Heck yeah, I bring an inflatable air mattress in the field because I, yeah. I want to be comfy. So Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> all right, that does it for this panel. Again, thank you all so much. This was so fun and so awesome. You're all great, and I look forward to seeing you all at the museum um, one day soon. Jen, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much to everybody who tuned in. Um, as always, you know, if you love this program and you want to support programs like it at the ALF Museum, you can find links on how to do that in the description below. And make sure you like and subscribe for more stories from the world of paleontology. Thank you all so much. And hopefully we'll see you at the museum soon.